Coming up on Smart Tech today, Matthew Casanelli and I sit down and get serious about biodegradable paper. Plus, we've got smart bottles, uh, bottles popping all around, and some information about Nest and how to connect it to your home kit system. Before we round things out with our projects and our picks of the week, stay tuned. Smart Tech Today is brought to you from LastPass Studios. You're focused on security, but are your employees? LastPass can ensure that they are by making access and authentication seamless. Visit lastpass.com slash twit to learn more. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This episode of Smart Tech Today is brought to you by Mint Mobile. They provide the same premium network coverage you're used to, but at a fraction of the cost because everything is online. Mint Mobile makes it easy to cut your wireless bill down to just 15 bucks a month with their three-month introductory plan and get the plan shipped to your door for free at mintmobile.com slash STT. And by IT Pro TV. Get the most up-to-date IT training with IT Pro TV. Their video courses, virtual labs, and practice tests will give you everything you need to become a successful IT professional. Visit itpro.tv slash smart for an additional 30% off for the lifetime of your active subscription and use the code SMART30 at checkout. Welcome back to Smart Tech Today, where we explain the exciting, the dynamic, and the sometimes confusing subject that is the Internet of Things. I am Micah Sargent. And I'm Matthew Casanelli. That's right. And today, we're talking about paper. <laughs> Sorry, I was like, what? <laughs> we're um, it's just a segue, right? We're just getting into it. Yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, we're Internet hopping connected in. Wave, uh, paper from scientists from Japan, which is pretty cool. Um, it's like a super thin sheet of paper that basically can send data over the Internet with like a little bit of sensors on it and things like that, that after 40 days bio is biodegradable and will completely dissolve. Um, so it's basically, I think... One of the ideas here is that it's like an Internet of Things type manufacturing system, but um, it's pretty cool just because it, the, like the way they said is you can stick it in hard to reach areas and then it'll just dissolve instead of having like a bunch oh. of sensors that you have to go collect and gather. Um, but I totally want this for my plant that's here. I watered it because last week we were talking about how <laughs> it's almost dying. Um, so that's been... Um, That'll be interesting to get uh, like a consumer level of something like this in the future. You'd have to buy more of them though in the end. Yeah, but I mean, I think it's, uh, I'm thinking of this for one of my future projects is like you don't necessarily always need continuous data forever. Just having like a month worth of data to really understand trends or something like that, then you can like there, I think they were talking about just I mean, basic stuff like knowing when to water. Um, so that makes sense can yeah. figure out the trends over a month i guess like annual cycles and stuff like that but we're gonna, still it is like within 40 days 95 percent of the volume decomposes yeah this is uh this is interesting except because uh, i like the idea of being able to put them like you said in, in hard to reach places and then not having to climb back up that ladder to get them again i suppose the one thing <laughs> that concerns me is if you are using them for you know s soil wetness or something like that are they pricey um I, you know do you buy a, a sheet of them and then you have enough for a year or how does that work i'm i'm kind of wondering but as a proof of concept i think this is a really good idea there was a a report recently um about how different people are using uh the internet of things for nature uh, different nature applications, mm -hmm. and so it was. It was really fascinating, and I'm trying to find now. Uh, I was going to talk about it on Tech News Weekly uh, earlier this or this past week because it basically had a whole list of all of these different ways that um, the Internet of Things was being used to sort of power uh, all sorts of of nature mm. efforts. So that included. Um, Oh, here, I just found it. Uh, so it's it's from Tech Republic, and I'll post it here in our spreadsheet. Um, cool. Just down here. 
and it's called The Internet of Wild Things, Technology and the Battle Against Biodiversity Loss and Climate Change. Mm -hmm. So in it, uh, they talk about using these special uh, camera systems that can detect poachers and be able to, you know, uh, track and, and record poachers when they're doing the horrible things that they do, uh, being able to watch as nature um, in a specific region sort of changes over time and watching for deforestation and and how fires burn and all this all this kind of stuff and it's all been enabled by new advancements in internet of things technology including uh, some of the wide area network uh, bands and and uh, you know using wi-fi and 5g and all of this stuff together to yeah. provide for uh connecting these devices so i think it's this this is a very very long uh piece it's it goes in depth about all of these different ways it's being used uh and i encourage everybody to check it out if you are at all an enthusiast but i can see how this paper this electronic biodegradable paper can fit uh in this whole scope uh it, especially because yeah, there are lots of plastic sensors with Bluetooth chips inside that we can peel and stick places, but we've got to think about how that is, that you know we're creating e waste over time for sure. Yeah, dang, this is a gold mine of a resource. There's so many. <laughs> it is. It truly different is. techniques in here. This is cool. It had nice. me kind of uh, inspired to you know what? How can I use these different tools in in my own? Uh, setups or in, in, I don't know, any kind of application, honestly. In my own overwrought home automation system. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I mean, that's a theme Too for my power. future my future topic stuff of like air quality. So <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm getting in there. <laughs> uh, this is interesting. Um, this is uh, so, so the next piece we're going to talk about here uh, involves smart bottles and before we get into it, I think this is one of those, well, here are ways the technology sort of can separate us from one another. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> but I'm curious sort of uh, your whole take on this. So guests of the Sacramento Kings, uh, which, you know, you, you go to these basketball games and you um, pay a bunch for a ticket and you get to give, get to be a little highfalutin. But uh, they're using <laughs> these little caps that go on the top of alcohol bottles uh, so that you can sort of pour a shot, pour two shots, whatever, into your glass and have whatever cocktail or whatever drink you're trying to have. In this case, you know, a shot, shot of Tito's bartender, um, <laughs> except you just do it yourself. Except that you're the bartender. You yeah. are the bartender. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, this is a thing that... Um, uh, the, the article reports that the Sacramento Kings kind of do this a lot to get people to come to their games, uh, technology this and technology that. So I guess it would feel more at home here. But I certainly I'm thinking about I've gone to as a tech journalist, I've gone to trade shows, I've gone to different events and. I don't know. It's kind of a bummer thinking about walking up to a bar and you just sort of are doing it yourself instead of getting yeah. a nice cocktail mixed by uh, somebody who knows what they're doing. Well, I think this is in the suites is what it's saying. So not the normal, <laughs> not for normal people, <laughs> for the rich people basically. <laughs> but it's like a whole, it's just like, I mean, I guess I didn't immediately think of the, the angle of like replacing bartenders, but it's it's, I thought it was like, limitations on drinking too much because you can only take like two shots or something like that. Uh, um, but it like goes on the lid. It's from a company called Nina where you basically, it like portions it out as you're pouring it and stuff like that. Um, so I can see, especially in the sweet type of experience, like I think I went to one, one time when I was younger and it was, I was like, I shouldn't be here. I'm a fraud. Um, right? Yeah. <laughs> there's some major, uh, what is that? Uh, imposter syndrome syndrome yeah. that exists in those spaces. Exactly. Where it's it's I super swanky. I don't feel comfortable here. Why is this person massaging my feet? I just wanted to stand here. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that. I mean, I don't know which one you went to. Well, um, you know, <laughs> it's in the presidential suite at the, uh, no, I'm just kidding. Um, at the, at the sports match 
Get the sports <laughs> match in the great state of Kansas, uh, Kansas City, Missouri. <laughs> Super Bowl. Um, I mean, my first thought just went to like the consumer level. Like, I don't care for stuff that makes it easier for rich people to get drunk without talking to people. But <laughs> just like even limiting yourself or having the awareness as you pour how much it is, it's kind of like um, a lot of times when you think of see things like the. I don't think Amazon tap isn't the right word, but it's a tap, a smart like water dispenser thing where you can be like, um, lady in the can, give me a, a, like one cup of water and stuff right. like that. Where at first it seems like who needs to use your voice to turn on the water, but then when it can measure specific amounts and stuff like that, I always think that's neat. I th I get I get where you're coming from there because certainly I can mix up a cocktail and go, wow, that really kicked a little harder than I'm used to. Mm, yeah, it's exactly. Because I didn't use my jigger to measure uh, the perfect amount. <laughs> uh, as Reverb Mike in the chat points out. It's also good so that it doesn't take an entire quarter for them to actually bring you your drink. The booze yeah. is right there. You just pour your own. Um, I, don't, I think that's fair. Certainly I, the, the ability to measure out the exact amount for your beverage is kind of nice. Um, when I was in college, I studied abroad and we went to a bar there that had like dispensers at every table for the taps and each individual person had their own um tab where you could like choose how much beer you wanted and then it would switch as you're dispensing it directly into your beer so at least in that situation there was still like a couple bartenders but you could just kind of like sit around the table and get more beer as you want um and there was a whole like system where i think you competed against the other tables and then to drink even more? like the bars and stuff like that yeah oh, um dear. when we came back i totally used it in like a uh, my like business plan in my marketing class of like bars like that, but among U.S. colleges where it's like, oh, this college drinks the most and stuff like that. It's it's uh, it's like there's downsides to the business plan, but um, <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure like failure. Then, that's the downside uh, of the business yeah, fair. plan. Um, I'm pretty sure since then, like somebody's actually come up with that business from like a business class and something like that. And I was like, man, I should have actually done. Yeah, that. <laughs> you should you should have beat him to the punch there. Um, Engadget also points out this is kind of along the lines of those cashierless systems. Uh, Amazon just launched their new version of uh, yeah. Amazon Go, which is a grocery store concept. There's a new one now that's a lot bigger, uh, has a lot more groceries inside. Um, we talked uh, last week, Jason Howell and I talked uh, about that actual uh, system and it was, there are a bunch of sensors. The only yeah. place where there are um, where there are actual people in place out and about is the liquor section because they you need to be 21 <laughs> it, before you go inside. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, that was uh, Sam Moscovich of Ars Technica, uh, and he was trying to see if he could could fake yeah. out the system and uh, did it's some. It's a good article. <laughs> yeah, it's a. He really, like changed his jacket oh, and man. like picked the thing up, went over somewhere else, came back, set it down while also taking another thing and handing it behind his own back and stuff like that. So he's like really trying to get him. I I'm joked. pretty sure he did steal some stuff though. I was like, I wouldn't approve this piece. But. <laughs> I joked it was like uh, reading Homer's Iliad or Odyssey. Um, yeah, it was kind of an epic, an epic piece. But so to be <laughs> clear, because we did ask about that at the end, uh, for one, he did get charged for a banana and an avocado an avocado he didn't take with him. He left outside of the um, oh, yeah. grocery store. Uh, <laughs> he got charged for the banana he did take. But the problem was anything he took after that, he uh, was not charged for. And so in return, he made a donation to the local food bank uh, oh, there nice. uh, for much more money <laughs> than he walked away with. Like $5. Uh, yeah, yeah, or whatever. yeah. So good, good there, although Amazon is now calling him a bad actor. Um, yeah, it says, we don't create these systems for bad actors. We create it for everyday citizens or something like that. It was yeah. kind of intense. They were a little upset about <laughs> it. Uh, but, Some lawyers, like, no thanks. Yeah, exactly. But journalists got to do what journalists got to do. So we do appreciate uh, that, the, having Sam on earlier to have that conversation. But, um, you know, that this kind of is down that thing where you go in, you sort of get the stuff on your own and it makes me think we're going to have uh 
you know, those those big jugs that you can fill with uh, local brewed kombucha or something like that. Um, locally, what is it? Fermented kombucha. And so you can just yeah. walk in with your jug and you <laughs> fill it up and then you can walk out and uh, it's charged to your to your uh, phone automatically. <laughs> I thought you were going to say you could just like go into Whole Foods and like take two shots from one of the things and just pay for that there. Now, I do not encourage that um, <laughs> unless you can you can show that you were dropped off by an like it's it's a program that's tied in with Uber and Lyft or something. Yeah. Somewhere. Where if you've been dropped off and you're you have to get picked up by one of those services, then you can have your little booze in the store uh, because right now you can't do that, <laughs> no, at least not without getting kicked out. Yeah, from no experience. That's the next article for this. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) I went into a Whole Foods, cracked open a nice Pinot Noir, and they kicked me out. I like how you choose wine. It's I just imagine you wine like in in a store. You're just like, eh, I don't know. Okay, (laughs) just let's move on. (laughs) Swishing it around like, "Mm, yeah, exactly. This is a red. (laughs) Now I. I have to say I'm very proud of my uh, knowledge of, of wines, so I would go past just it's red. Thank you. It's <laughs> getting a little awkward here. I'm, it's I'm an gonna... office reference. I know, I know. An Oki afterbirth. I, I, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's good stuff. Um, let's move on to our next story sure. here. Uh, this is something that I didn't know that we were getting. I saw that uh, Google's Nest system was not doing so hot. Um Earlier this past week, uh, the Google Nest, the whole system was hit with a huge outage. It took out live video, uh, took out recording history. And so folks like myself uh, who pay for a Nest Aware subscription, which gives you longer storage, uh, it gives you the ability to set up activity zones and do the sort of person dogs, person, pet, and all those sorts of uh, types of detection, you pay for that privilege. And yeah. folks were going, listen, we had this outage and we deserve to have that money refunded. Um, so Google is going to be giving refunds to Nestaware subscribers after this outage. Now, I have not received an email telling me that I will get a refund but i do use the nest camera i'm wondering if so my camera has not been plugged in um Mm. and so i'm wondering if they know that because i was still using it but i was still paying for the subscription (laughs) is the thing i don't know i'm getting mad at you you're just the messenger here but um yeah i don't know maybe i have to contact somebody and say well um you were still charging me so i deserve my five dollars yeah darn it (laughs) Yeah, I wonder it is like if yours isn't on that might not count. I don't know. Oh well, okay. This is t- uh, in the article. Um, Nine to five Google reports that several of uh, of or that some folks at Nine to five Google have active Nest Aware subscriptions and have yet to receive an email telling them that they will be getting a refund. So they might still be processing. I'm watching yeah. you, Google. Fair. Yeah, I'm I guess this was my just over the weekend. Cam. So waiting for Kevin to switch the camera back to this very intense thing I'm doing here. <laughs> I'm watching you with my Nest Cam, Google. It's active. I mean, it's aware, not active. Well, um, you could be listening if you were using the Starling Home Hub. Oh, segue. It is a segue. But before we get there, I do want oh, to yeah. tell you folks about uh, Mint Mobile. We're bringing you this episode of Smart Tech today. If you're still using one of the big wireless providers this year, have you asked yourself what you're paying for? Between expensive retail stores, inflated prices, and way too many hidden fees, you're being taken advantage of because they know you'll pay. They know I'll pay. Well... Enter Mint Mobile. Mint Mobile provides the same premium network coverage you're used to, but at a fraction of the cost because everything's online. Mint Mobile saves on retail locations and overhead, then passes those savings directly to you. It is fantastic as a uh, get the card and go with whatever device you have service. Uh, I plug that thing in and sometimes my iPad, it keeps a connection even when my iPhone, which is on one of the big carriers, 
does not have access to to cellular service. So Mint Mobile really has come through whenever I needed it, and uh, I appreciate that as well as the ridiculously inexpensive prices. Mint Mobile makes it easy to cut your wireless bill down to just fifteen bucks a month with their three month introductory plan. Every plan comes with unlimited nationwide talk and text. And with Mint Mobile, you stop paying for unlimited data you're not going to use. Instead, you choose between plans with 3, 8, or 12 gigabytes of 4G LTE data. You can use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan, like I mentioned, and keep your same phone number along with all of your existing contacts. You don't have to worry about any of that. It's the same kit and caboodle there. So go ahead and ditch your old wireless bill and start saving with Mint Mobile. To get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month with their three-month introductory plan and get the plan shipped to your door for free, you just go to mintmobile.com slash S-T-T. That's smart tech today. That's mintmobile.com slash S-T-T. Cut your wireless bill down to 15 bucks a month with their three-month introductory plan at mintmobile.com slash S-T-T. I want you to do it. Ryan Reynolds wants you to do it. We all want you to do it. It's going to be great. You're going to save money. We love it. Thanks so much to Mint Mobile for sponsoring this week's episode of Smart Tech Today. All right. A bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. And a bird connected to my home network can connect my Nest system. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, eh. look, it's, it was always going to be a stretch, Matthew. <laughs> it was always going to be a stretch. Uh, this, no, I'm excited about this. So the Starling Home Hub, we talked about this system. It basically lets you use the Nest Cam, the Nest system, uh, with your HomeKit setup. Mm -hmm. And so. Normally, because Nest, well, this is the speculation that Nest is a Google-owned uh, set of products, set of devices, a Google-owned company. They've not added HomeKit support, which, of course, is an Apple uh, product, service, etc. cetera. Uh, so it is not possible to add these devices to your home setup that way. And there are some systems in place that help you do that via third-party means. And one of those is a system called HomeBridge, which we've talked before about, which I'm sure we'll talk about again. And uh, a, a sort of launch off of that is a specific little hub that provides the connection between the two, between Nest's whole thing and your Nest uh, and your HomeKit setup without having to worry about HomeBridge. Um, so that is what the Starling Home Hub is. Now, did you, did you get a Starling mm. Home Hub? Do you have any no. Nest products or anything like I that? I do not. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm branching out soon, I believe, because I just like have the capability with the, um, hooms that I got. So, yeah. but like up until this point, I didn't usually want to buy stuff that wouldn't actually all hook in together. So, yeah, that's kind of my thing. I don't care, you know, whatever system you choose to use, you want all of those devices to be able to work with it. And so I got a Nest Cam in the beginning because I felt that it was at the time one of the best security cams that was available. Um, it yeah. is no longer the only you know security cam that you can get that's going to do well for you there are many that do uh but given that i still have that nest cam and still want to use it i chose the option as a person who has the hoobs system that's home kit in a box essentially or home bridge in a box uh which we've talked about before uh this you just use the the system that sort of backs the starling home hub as the basis for uh your connection and so i tried it i uh, you know, unbeknownst to me, we were going to be talking about these different systems uh, over the weekend on Sunday, I think it was. So yesterday, uh, as this is recorded, I set up the HomeBridge Nest plugin oh, to nice. see if it would work with with my camera and everything like that. And it was working just fine. Uh, so I don't I didn't have to, you know, get the Starling Home Hub in order to have that functionality. It was something that I was able to go ahead and install with the system that I had already purchased in the past. Uh, so that was really nice to see. And it even did, uh, it, it created this device that 
it's a virtual device. It's the switch to turn on and off the Nest Aware location features. So hmm. within the Nest app, you can set up to when I'm out of the home, turn on the camera. When I'm in the home, turn it off. And they make that into a switch that's available via HomeKit so that you can sort of not have to use the Nest app to do that functionality. Uh -huh. You can do it from right within HomeKit using an automation. And so, so it's just like faking it as a outlet yes. type device. Yeah, okay. it's literally cool. an on-off switch, which was really cool uh, to see. So it is possible. We had talked before when we talked about this that I said I wasn't sure that it offered the functionality with the cameras. Um, but, yeah, you've got two-way audio support. You've got the whole... The whole package is available there. So, yeah, you can do it via with this. With the Sterling thing you're saying or or yours also. With Yeah, with HomeBridge okay. Nest, the plug-in that is at the basis of the Sterling Home Hub, you can do that. Or you can, if you just are trying to add functionality for Nest, then that's what this device can do for you. So I am of the mind that if you know a little tiny bit about configuring, configuring, not configuring, configuring <laughs> um, your home network and have played around with some of these uh, sort of smart home platforms before, my advice is to go for the Hoobs system, Hoobs, H-O-O-B-S dot org, because yeah. It's not limited to just Nest. You're going to have access to all sorts of things. I've got my garage connected via that. I've got um, the, I can tell the internal temperature of my Raspberry Pi's CPU uh, with a little plugin that I've added. Uh, and then the Nest stuff as well. But if you want a sort of plug and play and forget it, forget about it solution, then that is where the Starling Home Hub is helpful, I think. Nice. Does yours have this new... Because the main feature they added to the Starlink thing is the two-way audio talkback feature where if you have them, you can talk in between the cameras and stuff like that. Um, I've not experimented with that yet. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, I had to restart my uh, HomeBridge server unrelated to this issue. I started playing around with things that, and then I messed something up. So I am in the process of testing that. So I'll follow up on that to let you know. Because if there is a reason that, you know, because th that's kind of, that was my original kind of confusion here why would they offer the starling home hub and give you the same functionality in something that's available for free uh and then with homebridge with itself. homebridge itself and then also have this where it actually costs so i mean that's the same idea with um hoobs is like you just have to have an always on mac and i think most people don't so having That's this true. little, it's like a little hardware box that you can buy that plugs into the Ethernet. And then that just lets you like keep that going and you don't have to worry about like having a expensive computer running. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. If, if you ask yourself, is it worth that trade off? But I think for some That's what I'm is. curious, I guess, is like maybe the benefit of the Starling thing is more advanced features that hoops itself can't do yeah and that's what i'm wondering um, too maybe that's why you would pay for it so like i said i'm going to follow up on that um as soon as i get my home bridge system back in working order yeah uh and then i will you know follow up here on the show about that to to see if they're offering parity because if they are then hands down i think that the better purchase is a hoobs setup mm -hmm. uh, rather than just going in on the Starling Home Hub itself. So we'll have to see about that. Cool. Yeah. Um, so we, I, I saw this news fly by uh, early last week, I think it was, and I was super pumped, super excited. As soon as I saw it, I think I was actually recording uh, Clockwise, the show I do on Relay FM, on Wednesday, this past Wednesday, when I saw this news fly by. And I'm trying to focus on the show, but at the same time, I'm like, oh, I want to get this set up right now. I want to do this right now. Um, Amazon, they bought the company called Eero. Eero makes routers. They uh, are a sponsor on the Twit network, uh, you know, full disclosure there. Uh, but I've had their routers for quite some time uh, before I, you know, joined Twit. And I use that system in my home. It's a one base station, two extenders, uh, mm -hmm. there are two beacons, the Eero beacons and the Eero Pro. And uh, Amazon purchased that company. And before Amazon had purchased it, 
Eero said that they were going to be offering uh, functionality to work with Apple's HomeKit. So there are certain routers. There's it's Linksys uh, Velop Mesh Wi-Fi system and the Eero system are the two systems right now that offer support for HomeKit uh, functionality. So how does this work? What is it? What did I set up? Why did I set up? Let's kind of dig into that. So routers that are secured with HomeKit, there's no clever name for this right now. Uh, so it's just a router that is secured with HomeKit lets you sort of protect yourself, your, your home network, by limiting the communication of the HomeKit-enabled devices on your network. It sort of relegates those devices to their own little uh, section of your home network and then controls how they can and can't communicate outwardly from the devices. So let me get into this a little bit more. Uh, first and foremost is that a lot of times if people wanted to have home, smart home accessories, they would set up and, and they want to do it in the most secure way. They would set up a separate network entirely to have those, those devices on that was sort of firewalled and protected from your main network. Well, in doing that, you do run into some complications uh, when you are using the HomeKit setup and using uh, the, the Google Home setup and a few others because part of the communication needs to happen at a local area network level, and so those devices need to be on the same network. Otherwise, it's having to sort of shoot to the internet and come back down. Um, mm -hmm. So if I put this stuff on my guest network and I was logged into my my main network on my iPhone, communicating with those happened over the internet instead of locally at the local. Oh, level. yeah. So that, that firewall... Can be intercepted. And, yeah, or something. exactly. It can be intercepted and also in many cases can be slower. The um, Some of the automations might not take place how you expect. There just are these little complications that make that not as ideal. So you almost would have to have, oh, I've got my, my going about iPhone and my stay at home, control my home <laughs> network iPhone. That's not cool. Um, well, it depends on your definition of cool, but I would not want to do that. So this system allows you to create sort of a pseudo network within your actual home network so that you don't have to have a separate setup, uh, a separate network with all of these devices connected. And then it lets you uh, set up your router within the home app. So I, I did this in my home app with, um, with my Eero. Basically, I saw that it happened. I went to the app store. I updated the Eero app. I launched the Eero app. The Eero app said, blah, 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 now works with Apple HomeKit. I tapped to set it up, and I went through the process, which included there was no needing to scan a, a code like you do whenever you do most of the HomeKit setup. That happened all automatically. Yeah. And then the way It's to, already using your Wi-Fi. <laughs> exactly, exactly. It's already already there. So the way to get to the stuff is, uh, for folks who are you know following along here, you launch the Home app, and in the and you're on the main tab called Home. There's Home, there's Rooms, there's Automation. And you're on the home tab, and in the top left corner is the home button. And when you tap that and you scroll down, you'll see Wi-Fi networks and routers. You tap on that, and it shows all of your routers and extenders. It shows your Eero Pro, in my case, my Eero Pro, my dining room Eero Beacon, and my garage Eero Beacon. Each of those three devices um, are using you know, the, my, my network ID to broadcast my signal across the things and then it shows all of the home kit accessories that are connected to the routers and extenders now this is where the the fun happens um you can enable what's called home kit accessory security so this tells the devices depending on your settings uh it, it tells the devices different things there are three modes there's restrict to home which Apple describes as the most secure feature, uh, you can only uh, use, the, the accessory can only interact with your Apple devices uh, to HomeKit. So to be clear, what that means is those local devices cannot access the internet at all. 
They, they can't receive or send uh, connection to the internet. It only exists on the local area network. So that's the most secure. Obviously, there's, there's no, you're not going to get firmware upgrades. You're not going to get any updates. You're not going to get any sort of services that uh, third parties might offer. It's only what's available via HomeKit to control those devices. That's called Restrict to Home. Automatic is the default security setting, and it lets you communicate with HomeKit which is the local area network, and connections that the device's manufacturer recommend it should be allowed to do. So I love this personally. The yeah. Like each of the individual devices, those manufacturers, so Belkin, it decides, you know, here's the list of of things that this device can communicate with and here's the list of things that it cannot communicate with. And so setting up auto allows you to um, communicate on the local area network and then with the with the uh, wide area network. And so, for example, for my Philips Hue bridge, um, there are several connections, and it shows you, which I think is nice, within the network security, all of the different connections mm -hmm. it's made. So I mm -hmm. see that it, it's pulling the time from uh, the Philips Hue website. It's pulling the time from the Google website. It is uh, pulling some information from Philips.com and some information from MeetHue.com. All of those connections, uh -huh. isn't that cool? Uh, and, and all of those connections are ones that the manufacturer has said, hey, those are okay. Uh, but then there's also a little exclamation point at the bottom of mine that says, some unexpected connections were blocked. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was going to say. I'm like, oh, God, what is that? Right? Doesn't <laughs> that make you a little nervous? Because uh, I would like to know. Uh, what those are and why yeah. why those connections are trying to be made there. Hmm. I wonder if that's like if this then that. Oh, might be. Here, wait. Let me look at. Yeah, because I, I devices Ella like that's my. I have something hooked up with if this and that there, and it's showing the same thing. <laughs> that you freaked me out at first. I was like, oh god, I'm being hacked. <laughs> um, uh, nice. That's interesting. So it's like mine shows the Lightning Philips Hue Bridge has Baidu. For connectivity, Google for connectivity and time. Another time one, Philips and Signify. I guess that's also Philips. You got but Baidu? Then, yeah. Hmm. Hmm. This is for I've your. Gotta, I gotta. I gotta check. What's you, going this on is here. for your Philips lighting bridge. Yeah. Um, Interesting. I wonder. Yeah, it's like I have a, a Samsung phone. Like that's the only. I'm trying to think of what else wouldn't be connected, or like maybe it is one of my other. Um, like the Belkin one is directly connected to it or something. Yeah, I, I, I should probably figure this all out. For well, sure. Well, this is good to know. See, yeah, <laughs> now you got that information. One of the other things that I like is that uh, for many of them, it'll say sort of where it's connecting and what it's using those connections for. Mm -hmm. So it says connectivity check, firmware update, uh, remote access for the app, notifications, and time sync. And then the last or the final option is no restriction. And of course, this says, hey, we're not going to use HomeKit Secure Router. You can just interact with the devices and the internet and locally without any blocking. So those uh, little th ones that say some unexpected connections, those get to go through yeah. if you have that turned on. And if you have it set to, um, to no restriction. So by default, it's, it's auto. And that's how I have all of mine set right now because I see no reason to block all of the connections for the devices that I have. Um, but maybe in the future, if I need to, I will. <laughs> I'll try to hack you. Yeah, yeah. then I'll really <laughs> have to lock it up. Um, so it's basically like, I mean, because so, I saw the same thing and I was like, sweet, it's got a HomeKit set up now. And then I saw the same tweets. Somebody else tweeted like, okay, now what? Like, why? And, and it was like, because especially I went through the whole setup process and it doesn't actually add them as like devices in the room in your app, even though they are associated with rooms. It's only in that little home menu under the settings and stuff like that. Um, yeah. And then it's like by default, it's already doing some protection for us, which is nice. And then you can kind of go further and have it lock it down and maybe you bought like a sketchy one that does get hacked or something like that. You could set it to restrict to home only and like ignore all of those um, like connected features beyond just the actual control of the device. And then it feels like the last one. I'm curious if um, no restriction is necessary for like Homebridge type things because you're, but I mean, yeah, I just don't even know at all. Like if it's, 
actually connected through HomeKit itself. Or maybe that could provide another layer of security for your HomeBridge stuff. Yeah, because that's the one place where I still get a little freaked out is yeah. I don't, because I'm not that uh, knowledgeable about coding to that level, I do get a little worried that somebody yeah. could take <laughs> advantage of me in in that area. Um, you don't dabble in Node.js development? <laughs> only a little bit. I had to whenever, you know, HomeBridge, yeah. I first discovered a HomeBridge, and so I had to read up a little, push up the glasses and read up a little bit. But um, I, no slight to anyone with glasses. I think you're great. <laughs> I have to wear glasses at night. It's fine. Um, so I think that uh, with that, you know, there there was a little concern. The good thing is it's open source and there are people who would come through and say, oh, yeah. no, this is, uh, make it, it's called the Looky Loo app instead of the uh, Homebridge camera connection <laughs> or whatever. So I, I have faith in that and that's what makes me use it. But I do like the idea of sort of, okay, I only want this on my local area network and nowhere else. That would be good. Nice. Well, I look forward to this. I mean, not... Again, I guess I don't look forward to it because it doesn't actually do, it doesn't change anything in effect. It just works for it. But I hope this comes to more routers so that people can just like be secure by default. Yeah, to feel more secure, I think is great. Um, and you know, you had talked a little bit about the some of the comments on the article. There were people sort of asking, "Does this mean that Apple has no reason now to make routers anymore? Does this sort of yeah. is this the writing on the wall?" And I think that that is. A fundamental, misunder a fundamental misunderstanding of what this technology does versus it's it, the 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 premise is faulty, I guess. Yeah. Um, and of course, I'm not saying this to you. I'm saying this to the the folks in the comments because if Apple chose to make routers again this would easily be obviously a feature that they would add because of course mm -hmm. they're going to have HomeKit support, but having this available on other things does not provide for all of the functionality that you got as an airport extreme user. There was yeah. much more to that experience than just um, home kit security. There was easier setup with your Apple devices. There was um, network connection and, and apps and things like that that helped you very mm -hmm. easily figure out figure out how you needed to set up your network um yeah the airport utility but, and stuff like that i miss i miss air, using my yeah. airport utility clearly you are a fan I, I, <laughs> um, a fan I guess i was just curious they did exit that business so far at least and so is this going to be like potentially their only long-term future plan is like providing the security level so that at least you're not getting hacked on HomeKit, and then the the router itself like because i was i went immediately and looked for like can i automate this can i have a, if this device connects to my network do something else and yeah. that's not any there's nothing there with that um so maybe that could come in the future i would love i don't know to see that i don't know if that would be i don't know if that would fit through this with like a manufacturer update or have to be like the router itself because yeah. that sounds like a lot more complicated networking which everybody loves to fiddle around with. <laughs> oh, God. Not I, said the cat. Yeah, that's um, why it's like this was so seamless. I was literally like, I don't even know what happened, but it I is. feel better now. <laughs> I was really happy because I thought there was going to be some sort of pause and, uh, oh, connection issue or something like that. This is yeah. genuinely the m most seamless setup. I think yeah. the only, th I think the failure happens when it doesn't automatically tell you sort of where you can find all of this information and make changes to it. So I was Wait, going, are you saying the home app isn't intuitive? Because... <laughs> It took me like, like actual practice to figure out to like force press on the thing and have it pop up the tile and then swipe down and then tap into the sub menu and then adjust the individual lights from there. Like it's, I, uh, I have my all my shortcuts for it now at least. But <laughs> I flew my mom into visit last week and her absolute horror at having to be re-added to my home kit home. Uh, uh, reminded like me, yeah, reminded me of how 
ridiculous the home app can be. Um, <laughs> like it's not Snapchat levels of unusable, but it is yeah. an, an inscrutable, but it is certainly a difficult thing to use. She's like, oh no, I, do I really have to? I like, well, no, I've got plenty of physical <laughs> switches, but if you want to, okay, okay. Uh, so I don't, you know, I, I don't blame her for not enjoying that experience at all. Yeah. It's like I had to basically learn it for my work for yeah. this type of stuff exactly, so yeah, exactly. Like, i had a reason otherwise it's not yeah exactly otherwise i'd run far away no i'm kidding it's not <laughs> Uh, let's take a quick break before we come back for our last segment i want to tell you about it pro tv as a busy working professional it can be difficult to learn new skills or make a career change but IT Pro TV has made learning IT and finishing IT certifications possible. Students are able to learn quickly and at their own pace when their time allows it. IT Pro TV offers binge-worthy learning for IT professionals and always keeps their content fresh as the IT world is constantly changing. It's in their core values to have content that is current, relevant, and up-to-date. They are continuously filming out of six high-definition studios, providing you with training for what's in the IT field today. You're going to get the latest exam objectives. You're going to get new certifications, updated software releases, redesigned interfaces, and more. Another awesome feature is that free members can watch the daily live stream at no cost. Watch as the shows are created. IT Pro TV's co-founders uh, created IT Pro TV because it's the IT training they wanted to have for themselves. It's engaging, it's conversational, it's affordable, and it's convenient. There are over 4,000 hours of IT training that they offer, and they are the official video training partner for CompTIA and have 12 CompTIA on-demand courses, including CompTIA A+, Network+, and Security+, Plus certs. You can see how IT Pro TV can make it easy for you to grow your career, you just head to itpro.tv slash smart and use the code SMART30 to receive 30% off. God, I love that URL. It's itpro.tv slash smart because you're smart to use the code SMART30 for an additional 30% off for the lifetime. And that's right. For the lifetime of your active subscription, IT Pro TV, build or expand your IT career and enjoy the journey. Thanks so much to IT Pro TV for making us all smarter and for sponsoring this week's episode of Smart Tech Today. All righty, Matthew, it's time for some questions or just a question, actually. Uh, so Jeremy from Albuquerque asks, I was trying to set up an automation in HomeKit to have a light turn on when someone arrives at home after dark. But when setting up the automation, I noticed that home didn't have my address on the map. So I wanted to know what triggers me getting home. It would either be me arriving at my address or joining the network my Apple TV is on. Would you please exp explain? Because I can't find any way to change my address for the home location. Well, this is one of those fun things where I'm also having a similar problem and not because of um, like the home not being necessary. I, I, it's just not showing up. Like whenever I come home now, my stuff isn't actually triggering it. Um, I did recently find that in my iPhone settings in the contacts app, I would just happen to some, I have no clue why I was actually <laughs> looking at it. Uh -huh. Um but there is a tab called my info and nothing was selected there where that's like who your person is. And, and just that way it's like, what's my name? <laughs> Say my name, uh, Heisenberg. Uh, but, um, <laughs> Say my name. Um, the, I feel like that is one way to associate just more of uh, the location data. There is also, um, in the privacy tab of settings, there's location services. And then if you scroll all the way to the bottom, there's significant locations, or wait, uh, it's system services and then significant locations. And this is a, just an amazing screen in general because it's basically your phone telling you when you've been at certain places like home or work. It's actually sometimes it, like most times when people find this screen, they get really creeped out because they didn't know where, that it, iPhone yeah. was doing what Google does. Well, that's it how I felt tracks, about it when I first yes, saw it. Yes, exactly. That's exactly how it feels. But because it's literally like, 
from 12.09 to 4.56 p.m. arrived via a 16-minute walk. It's like very specific data. But basically, this is what um, iPhones like collect about you locally. And then they can just tell other apps their home. And it doesn't actually have to send that like specific location data to them. Um, but this basically hasn't really resolved my problem yet. So I am still working on this. Um, yeah. So, but I mean, part of it is just connecting to the Wi-Fi network also. Right. So uh, th this is this is what Apple says. Um, your location, this is not even just specifically speaking about what is considered home. I want to just talk about starting off. Mm -hmm. uh, your location is determined by the location of the device that you use that you set up in your iCloud settings. So if you go into, uh, if you launch the settings app and at the top, there's the the photo of you and then your name and then underneath it says Apple ID, iCloud, iTunes, and App Store. You tap on that and then you tap Find My. Underneath My Location, you'll see uh, that it shows there this for, for me, it shows this device and cellular Apple watches. So if I'm wearing a cellular Apple watch and I'm logged into my Apple ID, and if I have my iPhone uh, the, as the selected one, then that is the device that it uses to determine what my location is. So you that's your first step is figuring out which of your devices is being used to determine your location. And once you have that figured out, then you should understand that for HomeKit, HomeKit is a Wi-Fi based uh, home framework for your different devices. So it's using both GPS and then your home network as the basis because without your home network set up, you can't have a, uh, a, a actual home in the, what am I trying to say? Without the home network set up, you can't create a home hub in your actual app, in the home app. Mm -hmm. So it's all about that connection that takes place whenever you log on, uh, whenever you log onto the server. And the way that uh, this is sort of spelled out is you can set it so that the cameras in your home, um, when you have them set up as HomeKit enabled cameras, you can set it up so that when either everyone is out of the home or everyone is in the home or one person is out of the home, one person's in the home, you can go in and you can choose to have those cameras switch. And the way that it determines whether you're at home or not is if you're connected to your home Wi-Fi network. So there is no way to sort of go in and change what that network is uh, or where that, uh, you know, your actual home is unless you switch to a different Wi-Fi network, basically. So think of it like this. I've got one home in my app, and one of the first devices that I set up with my home was my Philips Hue Bridge. The Philips Hue Bridge plugs into my Wi-Fi network, my Wi-Fi router, on uh, within my home. Well, technically, it plugs into a switch, which is connected to my router, but that's beside the point. Then I can set up this home as my main home. If I was to have a guest house on the beach, uh, which is an entire impossibility, but in this fantasy <laughs> world where I have a guest Hell house on the it, beach, yeah. um, I would go to that home. I would set up a Wi-Fi network. I would plug in a bridge or I would just connect it directly with a Wi-Fi enabled uh, bulb or I would have Bluetooth devices that were connected via a home hub or something like that. That determines that that is that location, wherever that network happens to be. So mm -hmm. for this, it is not a GPS bubble uh, in the same way that you would expect for some of the automations to take place. So when you are using your home as the location point, that is what it's using to determine those automations. Now, I want to mention that there's something kind of cool uh, that is new to me um, I chose to set up a, an automation just to, to sort of walk through this process. And so I can choose when, you know, the first person arrives at home, do blank. Or when the last person leaves, do blank. What I didn't realize is that as you add people to your home, you can choose individual people to trigger automation specific to them. So yeah. 
I didn't realize that that was a that was a possibility there. So I could, in theory, have an automation set up that lets me know when my kid gets home from school or something like that. I think that's pretty neat. Yeah. Well, you'd have to have the method of the notification for that point. Um, I think I just like I think it, similar to probably why this request was set in is mine just kind of doesn't work now and I don't know why <laughs> where it is like. <laughs> Um, there is also Did in that go? location services menu, there's a home kit. There's both the home trigger and a home kit option. Um, so make sure both of those are turned on basically. Um, if you're having any issues with that, but it is, I, I like my home app doesn't have the always allow option. And I, I'm curious if that's like something, I Wait, don't know. Doesn't just the always does, allow what? Uh, location access, because I know that in general, oh. that's like been changed. I don't know. I, I don't always think mine does either, though, because it's not using yeah. GPS. It's using whether you're connected to your home network. So it doesn't need to have your location. Yeah. So I'm not sure exactly. Like mine's just and it's one of those things, too, that's like testing it is like, OK, let's both leave the house now and see if the lights turn off. Like it's not an easy thing. To like, you have to kind of recognize over time whether or not it's actually working, depending on how you set it up, um, which mm -hmm. is always very stupid. It's like, can you please leave now? Or <laughs> yeah. I, I'm, I want to help you with that. We'll have to figure this out. Yeah, I'm curious. Okay. I'm really curious why it's not working. Um, all right, tell me about your your pick of the week this week. Oh yes, it is the Eve Room, which I am currently 72 degrees with four stars of air quality <laughs> and 43 percent humidity in this room oh it's very low. warm in berkeley in general um and i've watched it go from 70 up to 72 and from five stars down to four stars of air quality while we've been recording this podcast um interesting <laughs> so basically this is a HomeKit enabled Bluetooth sensor um, from the people at Eve. They sent this to me, which was very generous because I've been enjoying it a lot so far. And it's also now driving me crazy because now I am determined to know exactly when and where my air quality changes. Uh -huh. And I listened to this. Um, I'll have this in a future story of how I'm actually using all of this. But I just watched this whole hour long uh, or like listen to this hour long podcast about air quality and how like when you buy new products, you know, that like new couch smell, that's like formaldehyde and <laughs> it's like poisoning you. That's why your brain detects that something is different. And there's a ton of fascinating stuff where it is like it doesn't always affect exactly the same things where it's literally like you're worse at strategy and stuff like that when you have low quality air. So for anyone working from home in an office, or something like that please open your window every once in a while yeah like i have um no central ventilation in my entire house here in berkeley and so even just like i'm almost positive that just taking showers and stuff like that has made me sleep worse in the last two weeks oh so no. i've been i'm like collecting all of my data now and then gonna be setting up like automations where turn on the air thing and now i gotta buy a uh not a molecule I've seen is supposedly <laughs> those are like the guy, um, his, his Twitter handle is DHS DHH. And I've never actually said his name or seen it. He's one of the co-founders of Basecamp. Um, he's very active on Twitter. I'll say, but he's like, he tested all of these different systems and was essentially like molecule stuff seems to not work very well, even though it's very well branded. And um, the, the wire cutter had as well. Um, yeah. And there have been some some more reports um, for for sure. Uh, now, I'm curious uh, ba, 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 on. Oh, you're that's what I was going to say. You are doing a show right now where you have to use your voice for about an hour, if not more. Mm -hmm. And your humidity is at f it's lower than fifty percent, isn't it? It just went up again. <laughs> How, well, where, what's it at right now? Fifty five. So oh, I'm that's not bad. So you, if you're speaking, you do want to have a, a, a humidity higher than fifty percent, and ideally, you would sleep uh, between fifty and fifty six. I think it is. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, humidity my, is incredibly important for my house. Definitely is not perfect for that um <laughs> it's been 
it was like it gets up to like 70 in the middle of the night and stuff <laughs> so i think that's maybe why i was uh feeling a little sweaty the other night because the humidity be. is just like and so it is like that i think i i tweeted this morning i was like great now i'm obsessed with this chart because <laughs> it's just like i like took a sh- i like laid in the room for a little while and the quality went down and so it's like is it me is it like <laughs> Oh, no. See, this is what happens, though. You start to get so paranoid that you decide, well, I've got to remove myself from the situation in order for the room to be good to go. Well, especially, I feel like it was one of those things where I was like, oh, no, I'm going to be really concerned about this. But in theory, with actual automation, I won't have to at all. It'll just, like, be accounted for, and I can just be like, oh, I need to open the windows now and again. But I'm like, especially the part where it makes you worse at strategy is just like I'm like an independent worker and have been working from home for the last two years. And I think the way the guy said it, he was like, if you could pay to have like a 200% increase in your ability to think, well, wouldn't you do that? And I was like, Oh God, (laughs) I like immediately I'm like opening all the windows and stuff like that. So, wow. Yeah. It's it's pretty fascinating. Uh, my my pick of the week is I'm I got to throw it back to one of my faves. Uh, it's the Logitech Circle camera. I believe we're on the second edition of the Logitech Circle. Yeah, Logitech Circle Two. Um, this camera is for me. I'm excited that it is a HomeKit enabled uh, camera. So it add some functionality there that I really much that I very much enjoy but I've had a Logitech circle camera for a really long time now and this camera has gone with me from every home I've been in to every home I've been in (laughs) and has always been sort of my one of the first things I set up in the home Um, it has incredible image quality it has uh, the the Logitech's version. Their online system for tracking and uh, recordings are great, but given that I have the HomeKit set up, that takes care of uh, that portion for me. But it is a good-looking camera that's incredibly versatile. Uh, it's indoor, outdoor. It's waterproof. It has a great camera and microphone built in. And one of my favorite things is a window mount that lets you stick it on the inside of a window to sort of look out uh, and, and see outside. So mm. you don't have to mount it outside. It, I had it mounted on a window looking out, and they, the mount is made in such a way that it sort of pulls the camera back a little bit from the yeah. window so there's no reflection that you have to worry about, and then there's no glare from the sunlight hitting it. Uh, so it's really well made, one of the best made cameras that I've used, and incredibly versatile. Essentially, the puck can be undone that has the camera and all the magic in it from the bases that have the power providing to it. So you can have one that goes inside your house. I've got a magnetic mount that I could stick on any metal surface. It's a very strong magnet. I've got the window mount. There are mounts for outdoors. It can work in so many different places. It's got the IR lights in it so you can see in the dark. Uh, It's got it all. And I really like the Logitech Circle. It's available for $120, and that is genuinely a fair price for a device that uh, has for the longest time been my go-to and one that I can I can consistently rely on to make to be connected to actually work when I wanted to etc um, it's a great camera that's the Logitech circle nice well I was just telling you before we recorded that I had a package to let off of my porch on Saturday. So that's right. Something like this is definitely on my list coming up here soon. Yeah, um, yeah. Also, that window mount, this is very specific, but it totally looks like a mind knock from Star Wars when <laughs> they go into the asteroid space slug's stomach and then they like jump on the window and it's like, oh, and yes. stuff. So. <laughs> oh, man. Now you made me hate it. No. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's like a creepy little eye poking out your window, but. That's I, the same problem. We have the same problem of like, I'm worried that it'll get stolen. If it's outside. The, the camera itself. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's great to have on the inside. Um, it also is kind of like a, a Daleks little eye piece. Uh, <laughs> there's a name for that. I'm sorry. I don't remember. Probably ocular sensor or something. Uh, all of you Whovians can email me or email <laughs> us stt at twit.tv with your questions, your thoughts, your feedback, etc. Uh, you can- or I want to jump in because yeah. I turned that into a shortcut, at least for 
or you could you could set it up probably with uh, Amazon's lady, but I have a shortcut that lets you ask like what's the subject line and then what's the message and then it'll send it directly to us. Oh, so put, make sure you post the link to that so I can make yep. sure that makes it into the show notes. Sure. Uh, mm -hmm. You can do that there. And uh, we record the show live every Monday at 7 p.m. Eastern. That's 4 p.m. Pacific, which is 2300 UTC. You just head to twit.tv slash live uh, at any time to see what's streaming live and all of the different ways that it's available. And of course, if you want to, uh, you can just subscribe to the show. That's the best way to do it. You don't have to tune in live if you don't want to, but you can make sure that it's uh, there for you when we publish the show by going to twit.tv slash STT. That'll have links to subscribe in both audio and video formats. Very easy to do. And of course, get the back catalog of content that is available. Uh, if you want to, people want to follow you, Matthew, see all the work that you're doing. How do they do so? Uh, the latest thing I've been doing is on YouTube at Matthew Castanelli. Um, I did a live stream with fellow YouTuber Chris Lawley, who makes a ton of videos about iPad and shortcuts. And we talked about putting Siri shortcuts on the home screen, which was great nerdy fun. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Uh, you can follow me on pretty much all of the social platforms at Micah Sargent. Uh, and you can head to chihuahua.coffee. That's C-H-I-H-U-A-H-U-A dot coffee, which has links to all the different uh, content I have on the web. Golly gee, that sounds kind of crummy. I've got content on the web. Here's how you find it. Uh, I'm a content creator. Ugh. Anyway, don't forget uh, <laughs> to, uh, to tune in uh, anytime, both live and by subscribing. But until next time, we've got to say goodnight to all of our smart assistants. Siri, shut it down. And there goes all the lights. Oh, I just probably turned the lights off. <laughs>